Welcome to the Better Buildings, Better Society podcast. Twice a month, we interview interesting individuals and get insight into what they think makes building better members of society. Subscribe to our podcast and share with your friends. Hi, I'm Stephen Forster, founder and principal of DMA Engineering. My passion lies in the built environment and in the mechanical systems that keep buildings running at their optimum efficiency, while at the same time provide the best possible health and comfort to their occupants. In this way, DMA is absolutely committed to making buildings better members of society. This podcast focuses on energy efficiency through the eyes and experience of building industry professionals. Together with my guest, I will lead all of us on an exploration of how to build better energy efficiency buildings, how to save our clients time and money, and offer practical advice for those interested in the built environment. Join me, a mechanical engineer, outdoor enthusiast, and green advocate as I interview guests with leading edge ideas for creating better buildings and a better society. Hello again. I'm Stephen Forrester, Principal of DMA Engineering. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Better Buildings, Better Society. This week, we are privileged to have Joshua Vermillion, Tenured Associate Professor in the School of Architecture at UNLV. Um, he is an expert in digital craft as a medium, material, and method, and has spoken, published, and presented peer-reviewed research worldwide about the topics of computational design and digital fabrication. As a tenured professor and designer, Mr. Villian offers a unique insight into the world of digital design practices, research, and his approach to teaching. And we are super excited to be hosting Joshua and are thrilled to explore more about the digital design can make buildings better members of society. With that is our privilege to welcome Joshua to the show and learn more about what inspires him in architecture and digital design. So thanks for joining, Joshua. Really excited to have you a part of this little podcast. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone. So, yeah. Um, uh, fantastic. You know, I, I love the title of this podcast, actually. You know, I think that's really important. It, it underscores what we do and, and who we're serving, which is humans, right? And then our, our, our globe. And so, you know, it, it, it's important to me. Um, and it's really easy to lose sight of that. As an educator, our students even, um, you know, they, they, they get bogged down in the weeds of, of, you know, every little assignment and to remind them that. The responsibility that they have, um, uh, you know, once they get out of school and and uh, you know start to practice, is it just incredible, right? It, it sort of lightens up the room and changes the whole atmosphere. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. It's yeah, great. no, and that's a that's awesome stuff. Good stuff. It's, I think, we as people in the building industry, we can lose sight of the impact that we actually can make long term. A lot of what we design will be around for. 20, 30 years. So it's important that that is thought of. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your background, early days as a junior associate. You know, I know you worked in industry for a while. Uh, kind of just give us a general overview. Sure. So yeah, I, uh, I, I did what a lot of folks in my my cohort did. My, at, at the time, I went and got my five-year BARC uh, degree and uh, then went on the workforce and worked for a few years. Um, but, you know, I had these questions in my head and um, that's, that's, a re- that's basically what sort of brought me back to grad school was to sort of, you know, really try to wrap my head around certain questions uh, dealing with technology and how they begin to um, transform our industries. And so, you know, the, the question I really sort of start off with is how much of this is disruptive and how much of it can just augment the things that we do. Um, and so, you know, I was fascinated by all of these sort of really fancy computer renderings, right? These visuals that would be spit out really quickly. Um, and I thought maybe there's got to be something more to it than just this, you know, the, the sort of technology side of things with our, our, uh, our disciplines. Um, and so I went back to school and um, I learned all about how, um, you know, certain industries, uh, I'll give an example, the steel industry, for instance, um, has been, you know, uh, integrated, reintegrating uh, digital automation for a long time, right? Um, the the digital information that they receive and uh, and produce um, it drives every small detail from how how something is uh, uh, well detailed, and then how it's how it's made, um, and then how it's shipped to site with all the logistics, and then how it's put together on site. And so, you know, it, that that was a, a mind blowing. Um, discovery for me. You know, I, I, when I went to school, I started 
um, you know, with a T-square and, uh, and a parallel bar and, uh, you know, all of this sort of manual drafting equipment. When I, when I started to, uh, do my thesis project for, for, uh, you know, right before I graduated, I was writing things in DOS and, uh, and letting the computer sort of render things out for me and, and sort of, you know, pushing, pushing digital data around. And, and so, you know, coming, coming of age in that, in that time, I think was a pretty interesting, uh, a lot of questions came out of that. And so that's what I've been sort of fascinated with and working on. Um, and that, that brought me back to academia. Um, at, once I stepped out, uh, I came back. So you really saw what was going on in the, um, in another industry, right? I mean, the steel industry and how they were actually detailing out the, the actual beams being brought on site and how they could actually fit together in more of a Lego format if you will, right? And how they could all right. be bolted together and how that actually came together in the grand scheme of things. Right. I mean, they, they, I think early on, they saw digital technology as a way to, to, to sort of simulate everything, um, to decrease the number of errors, to, to optimize things, to, uh, cut costs without maybe cutting, um, quality. Right. And so, you know, I think as a building industry, um, you know, there's, there's so many, there's so many folks, there's so many industries involved. Um, under one big umbrella, I think we can learn from each other um, and see, you know, uh, some industries are farther ahead than others, I guess you might, you might say, right? So um, the sharing of information, digital information is becoming more and more um, uh, prevalent, right? But for a while, it, it was actually a, a really big legal issue, right? You know, um, so, you know, it's those sorts of things that uh, I think are really interesting. Um, but I, I'm always been really just interested in making things. Um, and so I don't know, your, your viewers won't be able to see this, but behind me in my office, I'm surrounded by all of these models. And some of them are, you know, put together by hand with exacto knives. And a lot of them are 3D printed or laser cut or sculpted with uh, digital fabrication tools. Um, but this idea of, of taking the digital technology and, and actually letting it help us get closer to um, questions of performance, questions of production, and, uh, questions of materials, um, I think is really interesting. And it's hard to sort of scale those up in a, in a broad way uh, or in a big way in school, but we can do it in, in certain um, targeted and, and strategic ways um, here in, 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 in the academy, just to sort of get students to really start to think about that, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I've been fascinated by sort of using this digital technology to sort of get us closer actually to um, uh, atoms, right? So bits to atoms, I think, is the the key thing here. Um, it's not that we can just make a, a model quicker or more efficiently at the very end of a, a design process, but that we can. This enables us to continue to make and speed up that that process, that feedback loop between making and then going back to the and, des, and redesigning or optimizing or changing things and then making, right? As a as a means of simulating our design ideas. So, <clears throat> so I. Have, I couple of questions have popped out here. We'll just see how that, how this flows. So, all right, sure. hand drawing, right? I started out hand drawing too, right? Doing drafting old school table, right? T-square and all that. Um, and there was a lot of fun in that, right? And there's a lot of craft, if you will, in making a drawing look the way it does, right? I mean, it, it was almost like you were doing artwork at that point, even in just, you know, engineering drafting, it still was almost like a piece of art that you were generating. It all had to follow certain guidelines, but it, you know, they looked, there was a whole craft around hand drawing, right? Absolutely. That we've lost with the digital age, right? I mean, if you look at a Revit drawing and you look at what a hand drawing is, there's, a, there's, there's they're worlds apart, right? On, on exactly how we do those drawings. Um, and I, you know, all for the better, we can turn out drawings so much faster than we can by hand drawings. Um, but what, what was, what's your take from, you know, hand drawings is kind of takes a little bit of time to do. And there's a little bit of thought that you can put into when you're actually drawing, you can, you know, if you will, let your mind wander a little bit in your design that you're working on, where digitally, you don't get it, but you can make, you can iterate faster through digital. What, what's, what's your take on, you know, having exacto light, exacto knife models versus actually 3D printed models? <clears throat> right. Well, that's a fascinating question. Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to teaching, I mean, I'm in all of the uh, above sort of approach, right? Um, you know, I feel like, um, the tools change and evolve, right? Um, but at the same time, the, the sort of rigor involved doesn't. So the level of thinking involved in the critical use of media, right? Whether that's a pencil and paper, um, whether that's a pen in our sketchbook or a cocktail napkin in the restaurant um, when, the, when a good idea strikes us, um, or whether that's a computer mouse and a, and, a, and a mouse pad and a laptop, 
Um, you know, I, I still feel like, um, you know, there's certain things that never change, right? And so I, I feel like that that craft is what I'm trying to sort of strive for uh, with the, the digital technologies. Um, you know, what's interesting about this is that, you know, honestly, it's, it's sometimes it's a lot easier to sort of, especially when you're starting out, you know, to, to sketch, right? In fact, um, the digital the digital uh, media courses I teach, um, where we, we talk about BIM and parametric thinking, um, you know, oftentimes we start with sketches, right? So um, we start to think about geometry, we start to think about, which is ages old, right? We, we talk about um, the history of, of a word like spline or lofting, right? Which are, in, in for those who don't know, in, in CAD terms, those are ways to generate um, curves and, and lines and surfaces, um, but but they're 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 they come from the shipbuilding industry from thousands of years ago, or the or the stone carving industry from you know thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago, um, and so there's this rich history uh, uh, when you look under the hood of how we uh, begin to make things, right? And so thinking about that, even even something as simple as as uh, drawing a picture of something, but then thinking about how it how it could be pieces of it could be made in a factory and then put on a truck and shipped on the highway, right? Um, as soon as you start to talk about what happens after they make the drawing, you know, certain things sort of their their eyes sparkle. And my students, right, they start to say, "Oh, yeah, right." And so, um, you know, we actually are fortunate here at UNLV in Las Vegas to have a a really great relationship with our professional community and with the AIA, uh, for instance. And, um, you know, much, I have a great set of colleagues. Some of them are always taking um, students out to uh, construction sites, right? We, uh, you know, there's lots of construction going on. We just got a new football stadium. Um, we have a Death Star looking globe sort of uh, uh, new construction going on just down the, the road from the new football stadium. And so, you know, in a place that's constantly changing and constantly building, constantly in flux and evolving like Las Vegas. It's, it's actually a pretty interesting laboratory to sort of learn how things go together. Um, and, to, and to sort of hear all these competing constraints from all the different people involved, engineers, architects, and, and general contractors, right? So it's really interesting when you can get all three of them together and, and start to hear this sort of um, larger story. Uh, There's sort of an ecosystem of stories on, on how you sort of um, make things align, right? That's always the hardest part. How do you make things align and, and but make them look like they were supposed to align at the very end? Um, but so when it comes to the sketching, you know, uh, what's interesting about this is, you know, I, I still have my Moleskine sketchbook and I usually have a, a pen clipped right here um, at all times. And um, but, but what's interesting about this is, you know, over the summertime, something fairly new just sort of exploded on the scene. Um, it's this artificial intelligence text to image diffusion models where you can basically, you can start to write a description of something and then a diffusion model, the, the, the bot on the other end, pumps out a, a, a picture based on your language. And so <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating, right? Like I, I start to, you know, I, in my free time, like I'm grocery shopping and I, I, I have to stop and pause, I get an idea. Normally I would, I would think about like, you know, writing something down or scratching it, scratching it down on a napkin if I have my pen. Now I tap, I tap out a description on my phone and then, you know, five minutes later I come back and there's, there's a set of images as the, you know, the, the, the bot, the AI bot has sort of reinterpreted what I've tried to describe and visualized it. It's sort of like augmenting that sketchbook. It, it's not going to get rid of the sketch and it doesn't, it doesn't pull out like something fully formed. Like if I, uh, if I say, you know, I want a large cathedral space made out of steel and uh, glass and, you know, I start to give it all these descriptive, uh, descriptive words. Um, you know, it doesn't actually give me a design that you can build. Um, but it is sort of a fascinating way to sort of take your ideas and just quickly pump out in, in, uh, images of it. And what I think is really fascinating is that, um, just like when we start to sketch, we never have the idea fully formed in our head. We, we sketch to develop the idea to, to continue to ideate, right? What's I think more fascinating from these uh, these AI sketches I would call them is that uh, when it when it does something unexpected and pops pops up something that you wouldn't expect and gets you to think about your problem or your idea in a completely new way it sort of tickles the imagination um, and so you know it, it's sort of an interesting give and take where uh, you know instead of just sort of directing the computer the the the, the artificial intelligence in this case the diffusion model is sort of more of an interlocutor. You're having a conversation with it, 
Um, but it's more of a conversation that you might have with uh, maybe like a seven-year-old uh, child or something where it, it cert- takes certain things literally when you didn't mean things literally. And so having that conversation, I think, is a sort of fascinating way to sort of understand how this faux neural network thinks. And you're sort of mining it for ideas or visuals. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, again, it's just something that popped up on the, on the scene uh, this summer. And I, I've been going back and forth with this. And it, it's been really sort of popular. I, I sort of post the results on social media, on my Instagram, for instance. And, um, you know, I get like hundreds or thousands of likes, like really quick. People going, wow, that's absolutely fascinating. I go, well, I, 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 I kind of dreamed it up, but I didn't really generate it, right? And so... It's this really interesting way of sort of thinking about digital technology. And the question is, you know, again, how does it augment the things that we do, right? Um, I think artificial intelligence, just that word alone is, is really sort of fascinating because I, I wouldn't really say that a diffusion model is intelligent, right? Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I had a, an interesting conversation once with somebody in the psychology and the question was, well, are these systems creative? <laughs> And so, you know, you know, I, I actually brought that that question into my students, and we started to talk about, well, what is creativity, right? Again, it's really simple idea that you would think, or a really question, or a word like creativity, you would think that you know we would all know what creativity is. But when you ask questions about it and sort of try to define it, it gets a little fuzzier, right? There's a there's some gray areas there, and it sort of uh, begin again begins to sort of talk about well, how how can technology and humans work together, right? And how how can these things be uh, maybe augment what we do. That artificial intelligence is a long way off from replacing us, for sure. Um, but, but at the same time, I think it's interesting to sort of think about how um, it shouldn't just be a computer science question, how we use these tools. Um, designers, architects, engineers, we, we need to be at the table sort of looking at how these things work, um, how they might actually um, help us with our workflows. Um, and, uh, and, and there's all kinds of ethical questions as well, right? I think yes. So, so kind of just thinking about like, if you were to throw a first draft, right. It, at the bot. Yeah. 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 It, you kick something back and you're like, well, you know, there's a little too much yellow in that space or right. Or whatever it is. Right. And, and you're like, well, okay. What if I were to re-describe it, you know, a little, a little this, a little that, and see what it kicks back again. Right. And, and play it back and forth and iterate just to kind of say, Exactly. You know, just by describing something slightly Absolutely. different, how does the next iteration look? Yeah, these written descriptions are called prompts. And now there's this whole sort of crafting of the prompts, right? Like it, it, it's like you're wordsmithing, right? It's like you're trying to sort of really elaborate on the language. Like what descriptive words really work? Um, you know, is it, do you say house? Do you say home? Do you say villa, right? You know, all of these sort of words have connotations to it. And the way these diffusion models are trained um, with, you know, billions of images with metadata attached, right? Um, you start to, you start to uh, um, really think about the words that you use. Um, I actually, uh, the reason I brought this up is because I, I, uh, me and a colleague who are teaching Design Studio, we wanted our students to write better and to, to have maybe a, an easier time in writing about their, their ideas um, and their goals for the project. And so this became a way to get them to iterate their writing with a sort of immediate payback of sort of seeing what the, what the computer produced is based on the description. And so it was a way to sort of get them to um, continue to elaborate and elaborate further, right? Um, ultimately, I wasn't really interested in, even in the results, the images popping back at them, but really about those, those prompts. Um, and, and again, you can go back and forth with the, the bot really describing it. It's almost like a chat. Um, you know, as you start to, you know, change the order of words or, or their prominence, um, or, or change the words that you use, right? Um, you know, if you, let's say, for instance, you give an example. If I say, um, I want to, uh, really large oranges rolling down the street. And, um, you know, it might say, well, um, was that like the fruit orange or was that the color orange? And it might give me lots of other kinds of fruit rolling down the street that are all colored orange, right? You know, so it's these sort of things that you really have to sort of think about, step back and say, well, what, how do I say things succinctly? But how can I be also at, at the same time more descriptive? Like, so you have a limited number of characters you can use, but within that, you have to be strategic. And well, what do you really say? And I think that's a really interesting question to ask yourself. Um, and so, you know, the idea of how do you, how do you make your ideas and how do you describe them and, and how do you, how are you more persuasive? I think is the, the, 
you know, how, you know, the, the lesson I want to sort of relate back to the students, you know, so anyway, it's, it's really sort of interesting. And if anybody's interested in, in seeing the results, um, you know, feel free to stop by my Instagram account. There's lots of results there. Yeah. It'd be cool to see kind of what, what you're thinking about and what, how you're getting more refined in, in describing what you want to describe, right? Yeah, so, I actually yeah. have an, ex- an example if you want to hear of a prompt. Sure. Yeah, let's yeah, hear it. Sure. So um, here's, here's an example prompt. I'll start now. A stunning interior of a split-level villa, intricately stacked and iteratively interlocked stone blocks in the style of the Enos House. Extremely coherent. A fusion of Frank Lloyd Wright and Carlo Scarpa. People are sitting at a table eating dinner. Plants and moss and ivy growing on the stones, pools of water, indoor picture, long shot, architectural photography. So a lot of those clauses are strung together with with commas, and um, you know what you'll what you'll hear are a description of of the subject, then some details, and then um, further sort of talking about the atmospherics or the media, um, you know, trying to evoke let's say architectural photography or watercolor or, you know, whatever it is, right? So um, it actually has a, quite a broad range. And, and then the, the, the results that it spits out at you, you can start to, again, expand that design space by, you know, retyping language. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting rabbit hole to sort of fall through um, as, you, as you start to play around with the technology. Yeah. And as you were saying that, right, I could actually kind of picture what the building looked like in my mind. And so, Absolutely. It'd be, it, so it'd be very interesting to see what the computer did, right? And, how, yeah, and yeah. what my mind was interpreting. <laughs> and if you, think, if you think about sitting with the client and kind of describing a space to a client in the picture that's being painted in their mind and what's, you know, in your mind, and then have the computer doing that, you know, generating that first pass of saying, this is what it looks like, that, that'd actually be a pretty interesting design process with the client. Oh, that's not even what I was thinking, right? And you'd be like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? That's it's just a very quickly iterative to get to a place to say, you know, what, you know, what style are you looking for, for whatever it is you're, you're designing. Right. Right. You know, and suddenly it comes back and, you know, um, you know, maybe instead of granite or, you know, marble that you had in mind, it comes back with red sandstone and you go, I never thought of that. Now I'm going to type in red sandstone and see what happens. Right. Or, or, um, you know, or whatever it is. Right. So, you know, all of these sorts of things uh, are, are kind of interesting, but I, I think again that what I always come back to is is how these things begin to um, either augment what we do in 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 the, in the process of designing engineering, or um, how does it enhance or augment our experience spatially when we're when we're using a building, right? Um, another thing I've been really uh, interested in and um, uh, used to create these sort of uh, spatial um, installations with students where we would do design build um, installations um, is how to embed robotics and sensing in, into um, architecture. So the idea of how do you start to make um, our environments smarter in a way, right? Um, maybe they can react or maybe they're just sensing. Um, but the idea is how do you make, um, make something spatial that begins to be more empathetic to humans walking through or, or reacting to it. Right. And so, um, as an example, uh, we did a a number of sort of hanging, um, installations that you would walk through and, um, um, there were IR sensors embedded within it. And so things would start to shake and move or change their lighting configurations based on, um, folks walking through it, um, or, or, you know, moving their hands closer to it or further away. Um, and so, uh, just sort of thinking about, you know, again, as, as our built environments, um, well, I, how do I how do I say this? As technology gets embedded with more and more within our built environment. So if you think about our houses, right? You know, for a while, really the sort of only sensing that we had was maybe our thermostats, right? You know, it measure temperature and it would kick kick on, you know, the the air conditioning or the heater or whatever, right? Um, now suddenly, like a lot of the stuff that we plug into our walls are are connected to this Internet of Things or our televisions, our voice assistants, even our refrigerators and and stoves now, and toasters and coffee makers um, are are in some way smarter than they were five or you know ten years ago. And so, you know, asking ourselves, well, if this phenomenon continues and our houses, our homes, our buildings begin to get smarter, shouldn't we be a part of that that conversation? It shouldn't just be a a Google question or a question for Apple or uh, you know, architects and engineers and and uh, you know the, all of these professionals from the building industry should 
um, be at the table, sort of thinking about and shaping how this might happen, right? So we we're working on a on a new project here, a new residence, and um, we're working on some beta windows. And so the windows are going to be smart windows, right? They can mm-hmm. open and close to ventilate a space. Mm-hmm. And the question comes back, you know, how do you? All right, so you don't want to be cool in a space that the windows open or heating a space with the window open because we want to get natural ventilation going through that space, but it's all going to be automated. So that has to integrate with the HVAC system we're designing. And what does that interface look like? Just technology-wise, are, is there a language, common language that they can both speak that we can make it happen? But yeah, that's exactly where we're kind of headed. You know, windows opening and closing and, you know, how does that inter- interface with the HVAC? It seems pretty basic, but it's like, it's kind of difficult to do right now, right? It's the technology is kind of there, but it's, you know, it still needs to be formulated out. Think about moving walls in that space, right? I mean, that's that's a totally different, we have so many flex spaces that are designed with walls that have to be manually moved. But just think if you were just to say, okay, let's have a large all hands meeting and desk and things move and you just have a big common space right there as the people just congregate. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? And so, you know, there, and, and what you mentioned just now, you know, there's a big chasm, I think, between the hypothetical, it's all digital information, and it should be easy. And then the Apple model of it just works, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Right? So there's there's nothing, there's, there's, you know, you have to sort of build the bridge. It's like flying the airplane, and you're still bolting the wings on, right? <laughs> right. Um, if, if that's what it feels like, I think. And so that's why I think the universities can, can sort of step in and study this stuff, right? Help out um, where we can. You know, where it's not that we're going to be, you know, producing these things, but, but, you know, trying to sort of figure out, well, you know, for instance, where can we begin to target these things, right? Like when it comes from a market perspective, right? Um, what makes the most sense? Um, when it comes from a cost perspective, what makes the most sense? When it comes from an energy use perspective, what might make the most sense, right? Um, you know, those are sorts of things that, that we could write grants for in, 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 uh, in the universities to study, to, to measure, um, to produce white paper so industry can use that information and, and respond to it. Um, and I think, you know, to me, that that's sort of the fascinating thing here is, well, now that we can do anything, what do we really do? How do we do it? You know, that's the other question, right? Um, I, I think the industry needs data in order to sort of better understand, well, if we invest money into this, how do we, how do, we do it in a way that that'll pay out, right? Um, so anyway, I, I think that's, a, that's a really always been an interesting question. But more so as we, you know, we walk through cities now and, and you know, the buses that drive by us are collecting information, right? Um, the, there's weather stations at, at bus stops throughout um, downtown Las Vegas. They're collecting information. Um, what's interesting is they're, you know, now all the surveillance cameras in, in downtown Las Vegas are, are uh, using AI algorithms to sort of understand um, where people are, um, traffic patterns, um, where trash is blowing around, all these sort of things, right? There's there's things where uh, municipalities now have digital twins, right? The sort of um, uh, data models and virtual models of the of the cities themselves um, that that sort of are are trying to display and 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 simulate the information in real time, um, the sort of digital equivalent of the the real version. Um, so you know, it, it's again, it's a it's a really interesting. I mean, municipalities are really interested in this stuff too, right? Um, but they're stewards of you know how do we how do we, where do we invest money and how do we make our cities better, right? And so, you know, again, that's, I think that's a, another way universities can really start to, to play a role in, in studying these things to give more data to, to the folks that make decisions. Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, as you're talking about this, I had two things that really popped up into my mind. And, um, you know, you, you talked about like the buses and everything getting data. I mean, I was talking with another architect yesterday and, you know, more walkable, more walkable and bikeable spaces, right? But then- mm-hmm. There's also the traffic flow that needs to happen as well. So maybe if the maybe if there was a model that a you know at certain points this space is a walkable, bikeable area, but then you know due to traffic, you know everybody's leaving work or whatever. There's a model where okay now it's a it's a drivable space, right? And, and there's a yeah. I mean we were talking about certain places here in the Denver metro area where it was like yeah, that, why isn't that walkable and just strictly bikeable? But it messes up traffic patterns and they tried something in boulder and it, it, it failed you know because it you know traffic patterns yep. but it, i think if it just just even that right i mean and how much difference do you change a space throughout a day on how people are actually using it is it easier for them to walk across the street to go to lunch or do they have to get in a car to drive to go to lunch right i mean there's a big difference in just how 
a community can be used in that. So that's very that, that's a totally different way of thinking about how we could actually use a city. So yeah, it's fascinating, right? I mean, I remember a long time ago watching a film, uh, maybe it was William White or somebody that was looking at how the Seagram's building plaza in, in Manhattan was used back in the the sixties or seventies. Completely different than today, right? So there were lots of people eating lunch, congregating um, in small groups and cliques, and then you know, sort of looking out, everybody talking and and having a great time. Um, and now I think everybody just sort of is like staring at their phones, their smartphones, um, as they walk through, or maybe they stop to to take a phone call or to type tap something out with their thumbs. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And in a place like uh, you know where I'm from in Las Vegas too, right? Then you know that streetscape becomes so important. So um, you know, for instance. Uh, overlaying weather data, right? So how hot does our do our sidewalks get? Um, you know, in, in some of these uh, summer months, right? Um, you know, becomes an, another question when it comes to making our our downtown cores, for instance, uh, more walkable, right? More livable, um, and that's a really huge question post pandemic, right? As you start to, you know, I think everybody's questioning now. You know, um, do we do we keep real estate in urban cores, and or do we? Um, and, and what's the role of a, a central office, right? Um, in in a in maybe a new landscape of of folks working partly at home and partly um, at the office, right? So, you know that that's that's always a question, right? You know, um, where where do the the food trucks park? You know, where do um, how do we reconfigure sidewalks? Um, you know, the, the big question now is how how does our infrastructure respond to changes? Um, as the it seems like the automobile industry is right at a, a moment where things are really starting to to shift quickly. Um, and so, you know, to me, that, that has big implications on all of our Western cities in particular that grew up with the automobile, right? So I think Denver and onwards, West, um, Phoenix in the Southwest, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, up, you know, north of us, and, and of course, California, and, you know, all of these, all these cities that grew up with the automobile, um, you know, it, it starts to, to make you wonder, um, how that's going to change the morphology of our cities and how how we use them. <laughs> yeah, Seth Godin in one of his uh, podcasts, he mentioned that you know a city, if you think about it, has an operating system because it's the way the roads are laid out and the way the buildings are are laid out. But if you can actually change the way the, the streets are used, you can kind of change the operating system of the city, right? I mean, you can actually change how that city is used in in a in a crazy way. Um, even though the physical infrastructure there, but the use may change in how we, you know, during the pandemic, right? All of a sudden, absolutely, people could put their restaurants in the street. They would block pop off up streets. restaurants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Or I mean, empty streets that became cycling. You know, you, uh-huh. you don't have to wear a mask if you're outside, right? So something yeah. like, I could bicycle down um, Michigan Avenue in Chicago or Las Vegas Boulevard, the Las Vegas Strip. Yeah. No, that's all just really cool stuff, man. That's not all kind of jacked up about it. I mean, it's, it's exciting stuff to hear how we can just change, you know, even buildings. I'm sitting in the office today. You know, most people are working uh, home today. That's kind of just the way COVID is done. And, and we were kind of that yeah. way before. But right. How could you change this space to be something else that, you know, maybe the, the lady downstairs that teaches Tai Chi, the space could change quickly and she could offer another class when we're not using the space on Friday afternoons or what have you, right? I mean, how yeah. can you make these spaces change? And you can actually change the use of a building and, you know, she can get more more business. You know, we don't need the space. It's just, there's a lot to do with being able to change spaces quickly um, and how that how that happens. I think there's a lot, there's a big future there. So yeah, it's great that, it's great that yeah. people are actually thinking about how that happens. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, I, the other thing is, you know, how much energy is the building using, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, for instance, if if the new model is, you know, certain parts of the building are empty, you know, certain times of the day, and now we're all looking at our houses, we all figured out what exactly works in our houses and what doesn't, right? Like our our domestic spaces have largely not changed too much over, over a long period of time, and now suddenly I think there's there's a lot of questions and and uh, being asked about, well, what what do we really need in an apartment or a condo? Um, when we can't really leave it, right? You know, so uh, you know, all of those sort of questions, I think, are are sort of up for discussion now. As we start to rethink things, right? But you know, we our houses were, you know, the lights were on all day, right? Instead of you know being out from you know eight to five when we're out out of work or or whatever. And, and so you know, these these sorts of uh, uh, ways of sort of thinking about the city as um, as a a, a how do I say this? How does the city change throughout the day, right? How does it serve from right. being 
maybe a place of commerce during the day and to a place of entertainment at night, right? And not have to change locations. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's the biggest challenge facing your work right now, teaching and working with young people? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's several things. I think one is, um, you know, it's this sort of speed that, you know, as we work more and more with the computer, with digital technologies, um, you know, there is a sort of time where I'll, I'll say, you know, actually let's, let's slow down and let's stop for a moment and let's really look and see what's going on here. Right. So for instance, um, uh, we'll be thinking about or talking about, uh, let's say a workflow and, you know, and through some software to try to, you know, model something and, um, virtually in, in my digital media course. Right. And so I'm training architects, future architects. And so, you know, we'll take an idea, then we'll start to give, give shape to it with surface and planes and, you know, sort of manipulating virtual geometry around the computer screen. And then something will happen. They'll like, they'll say, well, you know, this, this is taking longer than I expected. And I'll go like, well, how long did it take? And they'll say 10 minutes. And I'll say, that's not long at all. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, I, I'll remind them that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when I was doing this as a student, um, you know, I, that, that same task, you know, would take the computer about 48 hours and I would lock the computer down and leave and live the rest of my life and do other homework and things like that. And then just keep checking on the computer and to making sure that it didn't crash and, and then getting the results. And so I, I think the, the acceleration is, is kind of an interesting, uh, uh, problem that, that we, that I see and that, you know, they, they don't understand how good they have it sometimes. Um, and so, you know, it's like, again, what I, I go back to is something I mentioned maybe at the beginning of the discussion here, and that is, you know, the speed that these technologies afford us isn't just to take a shortcut, um, but that, that maybe we can actually do things better because it allows us to really, I think, look at the problem over and over again and, and begin that sort of feedback loop where we can begin to optimize and integrate um, systems in ways that really, I think, can can help, uh, let's say, architects work better with engineers. Architects and engineers work better with um, the folks downstream that that make the stuff and, and assemble the stuff, right? And so, you know, to me, you know, in particular, the building industry, I mean, we're all sort of these fragmented uh, uh, professions and disciplines and industries, and we all come together around these one-off projects from time to time, and somehow it works, yeah, usually, anyway. Um, but but you know that that's uh, that's that's the interesting thing. So to me, how these things actually help us, how serious people solve serious problems, um, you know, it's not necessarily just taking a shortcut and doing it the same way we did, but maybe you know, in a tenth of the time, it's you know, with the time that we have, how do we make these things better, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, the technologies help us measure things better. They help us see things better. They help us see potential problems better. You know, if 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 building a building a physical model helps, right? You know, to me, you know, early on when I started, you know, studying architecture, we had to think three dimensionally. You prob probably had this problem too through two dimensional drawings, right? Except for when we had to build models, right? And so, building models is like the way of thinking three dimensionally about three dimensional problems, right? And so, you know, the, the computer helps us, you know, look at things three dimensionally. But at the end of the day, I, I still tell my students, you know. You're trying to do something here, make it. If you can make it, I believe then that you know we can start to really wrap our heads around um, the problems that I see here, here, and here. Right? Um, you know, it's how this thing meets the ground. It's you know the slope. Um, you know, it's where the roof and how do you turn that corner. You know, all of those problems, all those those things that we've always talked about as architects and engineers. Um, you know, the the question is, well, do these tools actually help us do them better? Um, or do something that we haven't done before, um, or allow us to understand them better and see things uh, um, in a way that helps. You know, when when the custom curtain wall is mucked up and they they throw water at it and and wind at it and, and measure its performance, right? You know, to me, it's it's those sort of questions that I, I think I want my students to really to really think about, right? It's not it's not about a shortcut, and I I'm always sort of battling that, right? They always see these things as shortcuts, and it's like some things you just can't shortcut right for sure i mean take, yeah. take the extra time and think about 
the next level of it, right? Yeah, since you since you just created the time, yeah, absolutely, right. Yeah. That 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 created time is 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 better used, um, you know, to to make things better, right? I mean, that that's yeah. you know, we're always working up against time. Right? Yeah. You'll never have more time. Yeah, so, it's how you use it, right? That's all time management. Yep, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So what, what do most people misunderstand about architecture and digital design and how that interface comes together? Yeah. So a lot of folks think that, you know, digital design is all about just producing pretty pictures and there's a lot of that. Um, but like I said, there's, there's a, there's an ever expanding sort of space of, of research and real world sort of applications of, of integrating technology in the design of making our built environment. Um, into the built environment itself, how we make, um, you know, things. Uh, so it's like, sorry, maybe maybe I'll back up. You know, it's not just about producing pretty pictures, but it's about maybe transforming how we design the built environment, um, how we make it, how we construct it, and then how we use it, and and how the built environment can can sense and 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 have a technology integrated inside of it. So, um, you know, to me, I think there's a, a lot of different directions. Um, to this and and the changes are happening really fast uh, almost on a day-to-day basis like i said i mean um you know now i can um you know on my smartphone i can um sort of see people driving by my house through the the security camera that's mounted and um you know my coffee maker tells me when it's time to get up and um and it's already brewing coffee for me and those sorts of things are are crazy but the question is i think you know what what can we expect? How can we expect architecture to change? Right, not just our appliances, not just our um, the devices that we plug into the wall or carry with us in our pockets. So you know, to me, I think that's the question. I have here talk a, a little bit about co-founding I made and what that is. Yeah. So uh, back when I when I uh, um, came out of grad school and I got my first teaching job at, back in the Midwest in Indiana, um, you know, the Midwest is still a place where there's a, a lot of industry still manufacturing um not as much as there used to be right but um uh but there's still there's still some active industries there i think you know in terms of indiana limestone um the hard and hardwood industry is is still there um that you know they they harvest both trees and lumber but then they're also making things like uh um furniture and things like that there out of hardwood um there's still um part of the steel industry in the northern part of the state that's part of the sort of um rust belt along the, the sort of great Great Lakes area area from Buffalo all the way down to Chicago, um, and so you know part of part of uh, what we try to do is to um, to create a, an institute um, with grant money that that could sort of bring together students who are there to learn um, and researchers and and academics and industry um, to sort of think about these problems um, and and so what we would do is we would we would visit industry. Uh, we'd listen to the problems that they would have. We would, um, you know, they they wanted to uh, continue to ramp up um, how they begin to integrate technology to to make things better, to make things faster, to make things less expensive. Um, but but you know, those are big investments, and to sort of understand well how they can they do that in in, in targeted ways. So it was uh, ways in which we could begin to do some some um, uh, R and D for industry, right? And at the time, sort of bring together a broad range of people to look at these problems. Um, our students learned a lot from doing those sorts of things. They would, um, so uh, for instance, what we, what we call immersive learning, our students would then get to visit and network with uh, uh, folks in the, in the building industry, um, looking at problems. And then the building industry might, uh, let's say the limestone industry might give us uh, machine time and and labor and uh, materials, uh, then to design something, but then to to try to test out that workflow um, from using digital design information all the way to their production equipment, right? And so um, we did that with the hardwood industry, we did that with the limestone industry, we did that with the steel industry, um, looking at different ways to to sort of make stuff and to incorporate R and D with industry along with education with students in a sort of win-win relationship is really sort of an interesting uh, model. And, and uh, the, the students that came out of that program, um, they're doing amazing things now. They're, you know, a lot of them are, are in leadership positions now in their, um, their respective firms or companies. 
Um, but the, the work they did it was amazing, right? So we would have these digital models um, and we would have this sort of screen capture of the BIM model. And then we'd have the photograph of the actual thing. And they were like, one-to-one, the relationship was just, I mean, it was uncanny, um, right? As we, uh, you know, we, we would have these really interesting conversations with folks, um, you know, the, the production people, you know, the, the folks assembling things. And we were all speaking the same language because we all were looking at the same information, really. And it didn't have to pass through the filter of all of these, you know, paper drawings translated into section and, and plan. And, and, you know, so we, we were all looking at things three-dimensionally in the same virtual model. So it was a really, I think, kind of an interesting way to sort of think about, you know, what this stuff might look like in the future more and more um, as the, the sort of digital model, the digital information becomes a sort of database that everybody sort of draws from and, and feeds into. So, so with that, you know, there's, a, there's some conversations that keep, you know, we, we have and in, in, in they're big a lot in the industry about offsite um, manufacturing, right? Modular right. construction. Maybe we make wall sections off sec- offsite. Um, do you think architecture in the 10 years from now, do you see that being a more prevalent or less prevalent or kind of we'll just have better ways that we ship drawings to the field and how the field actually is able to assemble it? Or do you think it's still going to be a mixed bag? I mean, if you had a crystal ball. I think it's, I think it's situational, right? So I think, um, I think, I think it's situational on, on place. I think it's situational on, on people. Um, so for instance, I, I think, you know, for instance, uh, prefab, right? So if you think about prefab or modular housing, you know, it's always the promise of it has always been there, right? Um, but it's always been largely dependent on, um, on the situation of having the, the right, the right manufacturers, the right designers and engineers, the right clients, right? Um, and transportation, the yeah, the right yeah, trans- yeah, absolutely, and, and right? transportation, and, yeah, zoning, mm-hmm. community, right? I mean, all of these things, right? Um, you know, somebody sees that and goes, "That's really great." And another person says, "That's not my backyard," right? Right. Um, and we see that all the time in Las Vegas. Um, so, in, in Southern California, has that problem when it comes to housing and, and those sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, those those problems are are prevalent everywhere. You know, I, I see it as a, as a as you know maybe a modular scale scalar problem as well right so you know for instance there's always going to be things done on site and there's always going to be things that are done in a factory and then shipped to site right um i think about that custom curtain wall right that this sort of comes in in chunks and pieces and then just sort of gets erected and clipped on right but there was somebody out there um you know basically uh pouring all of the the you know assembling the frame and then pouring all the slabs um you know that's actually a problem in itself you know uh, how accurate and how uh, uh, the precision of, let's say, all the on-site labor and all the off-site labor when they match up, right? How do you begin to build in the uh, um, the uh, for the irregularities, the the stuff that you can't um, anticipate, uh, or or you know, build in just the tolerances, right? So it's always about that that tolerance problem. Um, anytime you do that, so you know the the promise of of prefab or or offsite construction um, is um, is sort of tighter tolerances. You know, I'm kind of even even pouring a foundation, right? Um, you know, is there's a different tolerance there than than there is in a factory, right? So, you know, all of these things have to be taken with a grain of salt, I believe. And and again, it comes down to serious people trying to trying to work out the serious problems, thinking steps ahead, right? So, um, you know, digital models, virtual models, the technology is there to sort of visualize and draw things to just an amazing amount of precision, but a piece of wood, a stud, um, uh, uh, you know, something that's cast out, out on site, you know, it's never, it's never um, accurate to six decimal points of accuracy, right? I mean, that's impossible. Um, and so to me, it, that, that's always the, the sticking point, right? How do we, you know, how do we, how do we reconcile those, those things? Right, the actual materials, the actual sites, um, humans working out in a, a muddy or hot, dusty construction site um, versus those, you know, clean spaces in a in a uh, manufacturing facility. Right, the same thing with three D printing. So, what's interesting is that uh, 
you know, as we begin to think about robotic arms, industrial robotic arms, or or other sort of you know 3D printing, uh, but at a large scale, right? The question is, is is this happening um, in a controlled environment, and then you ship something to site, or is this something that can be deployed, you know, on site? And what does that mean? And and how do you begin to, uh, you know, how does it how does it situate itself in in uh, space with GPS technologies, and how does it go up and down hills with you know higher caterpillar treads and things like that. So, you know, to me, it's, it's a fascinating space, but there's a, there's an awful lot of, of, of question marks there as, as you know, you really try to deal with it as a, um, as a problem. And, and there's this idea of co-robotics. So it's not necessarily about replacing humans on sites or in the production facility, but how do, how do robots and, and humans work together um, is another, another way of thinking about things, right? Um, just particularly if you think about, Robots, robots that are arms, robots that are um, moving around, robots that can, you know, as quadcopters can fly around in swarms. Even, um, you know, what are the roles, and and how do these how do these things work in tandem? Um, again, ultimately, the question is: Are we? Is it progress? Right? Are we? Are we doing it better? Um, are the things that we are that we make do do people like it better? Right? Um, ultimately, we're designing, making things for humans, and so. And, and other organisms, right? So, um, you know, um, are we doing it better? Are we making the world a better place? Is always the, the bigger, biggest question that you're asking. So, you know, to me, I think, I think that's the other part of this, right? You know, the ethics question. You know, it's, sometimes we can throw technology at things, but the, the, the larger question is: Are we? Is this really progress? Are, are is the direction we're going um, really something that that's making things better? Or you know, it would be terrible if you know at the end of this we. You know, we realized we were on worst enemies, right? Um, so I had another architect on the podcast, and he brought up a very interesting thing about the offsite man- manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, people that work in a in a factory, you know, it's kind of you know, factory work isn't the most pleasant work, right? I mean, it's kind of it can be very repetitive. You're you're kind of stuck in the same thing. Um, and his, his whole thing was like, let's keep the guys on site, right? Let's outdoors, let's have them doing stuff. And he 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 thought that. You know, his take was having guys on site building stuff was better than having people stuck in a factory. Um, that was that that was his point of it. So you're right; it, it comes down to a little bit. You know, what does it look like um, on having two different types of manufacturing going on on site versus off site? What does that look like? Are people just stuck in a factory? Yeah. They may be pinned down economically, right? So there's a lot of themes. With you know, that. the economy of scales, division of labor, right? So you know, if it's if it's simply turning six bolts and then and then watching that go by and the next thing comes and it's tightening the same six bolts in the next assembly. Right. right. That would be a real darn shame. Right. Because, right. You, know, you know, I, I have a, a, a real respect for folks that are out there, you know, on, on site outside, you know, trying to, trying to put this stuff together. Right. Um, you know, it'd be a real, real darn shame if we lost, lost that. Right. And so, you know, there, there is uh, you know, I, I did have a, a chance to, to tour manufactured uh, housing um, production facilities in the Northern part of Indiana. Um, where there's a, a large Amish community, right? And and those folks are, you know, in a production facility, um, they still are a jack of all trades there. So in that case, you know, it, and it, what's interesting about that is there's the, uh, um, they they have um, uh, sort of incentive to fix problems and see problems ahead of time because it's it's all based on time. So if they get it done early, they still get paid the same amount. Right, and so you know they 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 start to um, if they can rely on 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 this sort of common sense, I would say, um, you know the the sort of the the, the um, their experience, right, um, uh, to to sort of problem solve on, in situ in in a in, you know in a way that's similar to how you would when you you run into a problem on site. Yeah, and it may even um, be that they can see. All, if they're building the entire structure, right, they could see all the problems because they understand, oh, well, that's, that framing is going to cause plumbing issues. Let's yeah. fix it now as we're framing it versus just kicking it down the, the, the assembly line. And it gets yeah. down to the plumber. He's like, hey, I can't run my, you know, my waste through here because I got a header in the way or what have you, right? So, it, And, you know, the, the part of that is, you know, similar to, let's say, building an automobile, right? You know, when it comes to manufactured housing, it's like you can have this one, or you can have this one, or you can have this one. It's not like 
you know, each one is a one-off proposition, but it, you know, they do the R and D, they, they sort of figure it all out as much as possible, you know? And so, you know, again, um, a lot of what we do in the building industry, isn't that it's, it's one-off um, uh, projects each time or, or, or close to it. Even if, it, even if, if, and if we have a client where they're building similar things, each site's different, each, each zoning uh, 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 sort of situation is different. Um, you know, each, each, each site has a different orientation to sun, wind and light and all those sorts of things. Right. So um, again, you know, I, I think we have to take it with a grain of salt. I, I think um, smart, um, smart engineers and architects are always going to try to, to find ways to incorporate it when they can uh, prefab, um, or, or, uh, offsite construction when it makes sense. Um, maybe it's about doing something too complex to do on site, or maybe it's to, to, uh, um, but, but, you know, I, I think it's always situational, right? I think it's always going to be situational to, to place to people, you know, it, it's just, I don't think there's a one size fits all solution there. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, in our research for the work you do at UNLV, it's, um, you know, the students have our, our hands on, right. There's a lot of hands on that the students actually are doing there, right. There's labs for them to go work at work on. Yeah. Yep. And that's have, huge. Right? Full that's- wood shop, full metal shop. We have some CNC labs full of equipment. Um, you know, last spring I did a design build uh, elective, with the tile industry. So they had their, their uh, international trade show here in the convention center. So they, they sponsored, they gave us all the materials. we made this large serpentine wall. It was all uh, custom, um, custom sawn tile mosaic um, with this gradient pattern that we made. Um, absolutely. I mean, it took a lot of work, um, but at the end, the students really sort of understood, well, first of all, they understood the material system better, but they understood that sort of idea of, Every line, every curve, everything that they draw has implications downstream when it comes to making, building, assembling, and all of that stuff, right? Um, and so, you know, to me, I think that's that's a valuable lesson to learn. Um, the sooner they can learn that, the better, um, because that then they can build on, it, right? Then they then they can start to they get they get better acquainted with you know using the um, using the wet saws, using a table saw to 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 cut the substrate. Looking at how to turn a corner, and you know, looking at how to uh, make something. You know, is it a rabbit joint? Is it a miter joint? Is it a butt joint? You know, those sorts of things, basic things, even just to get them going, right? Um, anything to get them to sort of think about those details, really important, right? I think that's where really good architecture happens. Is is you know, you can have a great idea, but if it's not executed well, it was only a great idea, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. So when I got my undergraduate degree, I worked as a carpenter for five years. And yep. I, you know, here, here I am, a mechanical engineer. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, why am I working as a carpenter? Now I look back on that. I go, that was the best experience I ever had. Right. Yeah. So I kind of, now I really favor that experience. And, you know, a lot of the ways that education is structured and the way tradespeople are, you know, at the trade schools and all this, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, apprenticeships that happen, right? Where you can actually work your way up and through all the way, like start out as a low level, you know, carpenter or whatever, and then work your way up actually into the, into an architecture part. So you have to have those mediums that you can actually get out there and you put it together and see exactly how it happens. It's because what happens digitally, you know, in the digital world and actually how that gets implemented, there's a big difference, right? I mean, there's a lot that has to go into that. One of the one of the most productive summers I ever had was when I worked as a, on a framing crew, right? And then suddenly, when I went back to school that next semester, I I you know I had to draw a wall section. I was like, oh, yeah, like that goes here, that goes here, and this is why, right? Like that was the most fascinating thing. Is like, you know, this is where the drip edge goes because, right? This is where the flashing goes because, right? This is where you know this is how I you know this is w- what we look at when we're putting a window in because, right? So. Those sorts of things uh, are become so important. You don't really even necessarily realize it at the time when you're learning these things, um, but then when it comes back, you're trying to draw, you're trying to sort of figure it out. It's just, oh, I see now. This is how this is how you you put that plate onto the concrete. This is how you, um, you know, flash that windowsill. This is how you, um, you know, put the coping around the the, the parapet, right? Um, and how it meets with the roof. And, you know, that kind of stuff is so important. Um, 
you know, it, it doesn't maybe get the, the, as much emphasis as it should in schools. Um, but, but that's, that's, stuff's really important. Um, you know, I live in a place where just about every building leaks. The three days of the year that we actually get rain, <laughs> rain, we find out exactly how much we didn't really take into account rain, right? You know, and, you know, the building culture here doesn't really have to worry about it too much because, you know, you don't have to worry about it three days of the year or whatever it is, you know, during our monsoon season when we get rain. But we have a lot of leaky roofs. And it dries out really quick, right? It dries out really quick. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> it's not a yeah. big deal. So uh, um, tell us a little bit about the bottom-up social change symposium uh, that you were a part of. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, one of the things I was tasked to do uh, uh, through ACSA and AIA, um, and I had a, a great partner in this from the University of Washington, uh, Elizabeth Golden, um, and uh, folks from the AIA National and ACSA National were working with us. Um, but we put together a symposium the last time the, the national AIA National Meeting was here in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, 2019 now. Seems like ages ago. That was a <laughs> pandemic ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It seemed like it was a decade ago. It wasn't. It was just a few years ago um, in 2019. Um, and so uh, we came up with the theme, bottom-up social change. Sort of thinking about, you know, there's a lot of problems there's a lot of problems. Maybe not thinking about how how uh, how we try to tackle them through these big programs with these you know big top down solutions, but how how folks are trying to sort of think about more catalytic ways to sort of address these things. And so um, you know the sort of bottom up became a sort of theme, and we we had some absolutely fantastic uh, contributions to this. We put out a call for for papers and projects. We got um, about 150 of them. We chose only eight of them, right? So we had, <laughs> we, we picked the eight very best. Um, and so we had folks in, um, Arizona looking at, uh, how, um, uh, water infrastructure in Arizona and like in, say in Tucson, uh, could then become, um, uh, better designed, right? Um, right now they're, they're sort of designed for channeling the water just to, to try to, to prevent floods. Um, but they sort of direct the water away. Um, and so, A, you get really ugly infrastructure, hard infrastructure um, that's only useful for, you know, the three times again of the year where they, they get floods. Um, and then is, is just sort of sitting there useless uh, the rest of the year. Um, but sort of thinking about how you could um, think about resiliency in a way that, that begins to um, direct rainwater, um, but then also not just to flush it away, but to begin to store it. And then also for the other, uh, let's say, 340 days of the year that are just sitting there could become, you know, soft infrastructure that could be used for recreation, parks, um, trails, those sorts of things. Uh, uh, really important, um, you know, you could also begin to think about um, uh, bird sanctuaries and other sort you know, these, these sorts of um, uh, corridors and, and places, spots where for migratory birds and other sort of animals um, uh, to live. So it's not even just about humans, but thinking about our, our sort of larger, our, our spot in a sort of really much larger complex ecosystem. Um, we had folks doing uh, community-based projects and design build projects in, at universities, but thinking about how things like uh, mailboxes in rural areas could become more than just about receiving and, and taking mail, but could become um, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, relaying information, collecting information, collecting data. We had um, Folks dealing with housing at a number of different scales, again, huge problem all over the place um, that our housing is expensive and there doesn't seem to be enough of it. Um, I think particularly out in the, in the, along the West Coast, uh, we had somebody from Seattle, we had folks from Southern California, we had uh, um, Angie Brooks from Brooks Scarpa in, uh, in LA, uh, for instance, uh, we had somebody from Detroit, we had, you know, all of these folks, really talented people, sort of looking at these problems from a variety of, of standpoints, but always from the bottom up. I think it was kind of interesting to sort of think about that. You know, how can we do small things that lead to larger things that can then begin get get momentum? How do we think catalytically? Um, how do we think in terms of small investments that then start to make a difference as they begin to, to sort of uh, accumulate? Um, rather than thinking about always just these really sort of really expensive, massive, top-down sort of efforts that that uh, that sometimes that we do, right? So, you know, the bottom-up became this sort of way to to sort of frame 
um, how we can, how each of us can maybe make a difference in our own way, right? Based off of our expertise and our interests and, um, you know, what we were prepared to, to do, right? Um, in our professional lives and in our volunteer lives, right? So um, anyway, that was the idea behind it. And it, it was great. We came out with a book and everything uh, um, about it as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, but I, I'm always sort of thinking about, um, you know, how, how it's really easy to say, like, we can just create a big program and throw lots of money at things. It's maybe different to sort of say, well, here's, here's how somebody's doing it here on the ground every day, right? Uh, day in and day out. And it's not a huge undertaking. It's not a huge endeavor. It's not costing a lot of money, but it's making a difference. And here's how, right? So anyway, that's that's kind of the stuff that we wanted to highlight. But it was pretty interesting. Yeah, that's we got, great. We had hundreds of people come to the the presentations at the at the AIA convention. So, you know, we thought it was a pretty pretty nice success. And yeah, what's the one thing you wish, you know, somebody that's getting ready to design maybe a new master plan or a new building? What do you what do you wish they would take into consideration that they typically don't when they start in on the design? Ooh, that's a big question. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I could, I could speak to some of the things that I see out in, in the built environment here in Las Vegas, right? Okay. Um, there's, there's an awful lot of disregard for sun, wind and light, right? And that's so important here in, in the Mojave Desert, you know, for instance, right? So, you know, it's easy for me to say, because I don't have, you know, I'm not a developer, I'm not, I'm not investing millions, sometimes of dollars into things. Um, but, you know, to me, I think, I think we need to be much more careful in, in how we think about even the simplest moves that we make in relationship to that sun orientation, um, in relation to the landscape, in relation to you know things like that, sun, wind, and light. I mean, it, it makes such a huge difference here. I mean, I, I do a lot of hiking outdoors, and what I've always been fascinated by is, is this, I, this idea of calling something a desert, thinking that it's empty, and it's not. It's not. It's full of it's full of interesting, interesting flora and fauna. But, but what sticks out to me about the things that grow here is just how lean and mean they have to be in order to, to survive and sometimes thrive here. And what that begins to suggest is that there is a way of doing it. And it's maybe not the way that we're doing it as humans now. Um, you know, it, we have come a long way. Las Vegas is leading the way. I would say one of the municipalities really leading the way in the Southwest as far as how we're, how we're, using water, how we're trying to use less water, how we're trying to recycle water um, in a number of different ways. Um, so, you know, I, I will say that that we're kind of a model, at least in the Southwest United States, for how, how to begin to do this. Um, one thing that helps is that we don't have a lot of agriculture here in Arizona. They have a lot of agriculture. Of course, in California, they have a ton of agriculture, and that's what's using up a lot of the water. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's that simple, right? Um, you know, when it, when it comes to place, and I, when I think of Mojave Desert, it's a very special, very specific place, sacred place, place to some people. You know, I think it, 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 begs, it begs us to sort of really consider and be careful when it comes to, comes to heat, light, wind, the resources that we do have here. How do, we, how do we use them as most effectively as we can? And how do we not just use them all up, right? How do we share it? So... You know, to me, I think that's that's always been always been uh, something that that uh, uh, you know you can't go out in the wilderness here and not see it, right? Um, it's not out of sight, out of mind. As soon as you, as soon as I I hike a mile away from my house out into the wilderness, and I can I can sort of see things. You know, it helps when you get up high, right? You know, out in Colorado, you can get up high and sort of see just how small you are, really, as well, right? So, um, to me, I think that's that's a sort of recentering. I always do just. Individually, I try to get outdoors. I try to get up high. I try to get in a place where I can't hear another single living thing. At least certainly not another human being. And then suddenly something snaps into perspective. It's a way to sort of clear my mind, refocus, recenter, reprioritize my thoughts and how I can be as productive as I can once I get back down into the valley and, you know, get to work again. Yeah. And Vegas is definitely one of those places. You're right. The desert is beautiful. I mean, a lot of people don't, un- if you've never been to the desert, you just don't understand how, how much life there really is, how hardy what is there is there and how pretty it, it really is. And then 
you know, for me, when I've been into Vegas, you're right. You can get away from Vegas and you can get out and you can get high and you can look down onto the strip and you can see just how small the strip. I mean, it seems big when you drive it or walk the strip. It's yep. big. But when you're far away and you look at it, you can see just how small it is. And then all the vastness just that's just totally around it. And then I just think that, you know, the sun, wind and light, just taking that into consideration on a building. I mean, it just seems so basic, but you're right. Yeah. Sometimes it's not considered. And so, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And then, you know, digital technologies, you know, that's one of the things we're dealing with, you know, always sort of like, how do you look at these things, measure them, you know, start to start to optimize and work with them. Um, you know, it's, it's another, you know, if, if you use the technology in the right way, it can help you with that, right? It can help you visualize th these things and, and work with them rather than against them. Yeah, you know? for sure. So uh, what is your favorite building and why? My favorite building? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. You know, I, I always ask people this too. and <laughs> I, You know, I have to sit here maybe think about this for just a second. My favorite building. My goodness. Favorite building I've been to or just favorite building? Favorite building in general, digital, never been. All built. right. So favorite building I've never been to because it, it's impossible. I don't even think it's around anymore is the Crystal Palace. So this big uh, eight, 19th century uh, glass iron uh, 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 building, you know, that they built in the UK. Um, but, but really sort of talking about the sea change that was coming when it comes to using steel frame and glass and later on air conditioning. And, you know, it was, it was it's that, that, that sort of uh, uh, building that perfectly captured the zeitgeist of what was to come in the 20th century. Um, and, and, and really sort of captured the, the sort of uh, industrial revolution that was to come, or that, that we were there in the throes at the time. Um, you know, I, I still, I have a sweet spot, uh, just a, a, a real um, soft spot for um, really large, tall, grand spaces. So I would say Chart Cathedral, um, you know, that big Gothic cathedral. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing. This, the sounds in that, the acoustics, the lighting, um, the, the, just the, the scale. It just, again, it, it makes you feel small, um, you know, and, and it's, uh, I think it perfectly embodies a sort of idea of the edifice as, uh, as the book, right? And, you know, this idea of a sort of illiterate populace that the, the medium is the message that sort of building the church becomes the sort of um, uh, message, I guess, at the time. I'm not a religious person, but I, I've just been always in awe of these sort of really grand spaces, these big spaces, no matter the religion. Um, it seems like for a long time, that was always the, the sort of doing of the church or, or government or, you know, that there was never a separation between the two. Um, and so I, I'm just a, a nut of sucker for, for those, those big, big spaces. I like museums too, and libraries and, you know, all those sorts of things. But um, yeah, that, that, that was a, that's one of those things I'll never forget, you know, going to see that. As we think about creating better buildings, um, you know, you mentioned the new AI technology, but you know, what's the biggest, what's the biggest lesson or, or what's the, what have you learned in the last year about, you know, that we can do to make buildings better and that you've passed on to your students? Yeah, I would probably come back to some of the design build stuff I've done with, with students. And, you know, this last spring was an example of that. Um, you know, again, working with industry, um, you know, talking to the folks that make stuff, um, you know, beginning to sort of understand that feedback loop between um, the materials and material systems and how that can begin to really, I think, better inform all those design decisions that we make. Um, you know, I, I think there's also a healthy sort of respect and app, uh, empathy that you, you sort of develop when you talk to others, right? I think there's sometimes there's a lack of respect when, when, when let's say, the, the dialogue between, let's say, an architect and a builder or, you know, an engineer and some, you know, a, you know wh whatever it is, right? You know, I think just having understanding each other better, you know, and coming from it where it's not uh, um, you can you can come to uh, to somebody with a degree of of um, uh, both empathy and understanding, but also maybe uh, humbleness to sort of understand. Well, this is what I do really well, but I understand this is what you do really well. And when it comes to talking about this stuff with you, I'm here to listen. You know, listening is something that I don't think. Uh, um, necessarily is a, is a, it's maybe a soft skill, you know, only some people can develop it. And so I think it's not something that is a part of a curriculum, 
but it's something that's so important. Listening, right? Being able to sort of read, um, to look, to see. Um, and, and so listening, I think, is a huge part of that. Um, to, to simply shut up and come with a, a sort of sense of uh, sometimes just listen. You know, I, I just listen. You know, don't, don't try to cut in, just listen, right? Now, maybe at the end you say, well, here's what I heard, right? Am I on the right track here? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I think there's a sort of humility um, that sometimes, you know, if we we all have just a little bit of humility, uh, a little more humility than I think, um, and empathy, then I think maybe, you know, maybe things can go smoother sometimes. And, you know, we've all had those collaborations where they go great. And we've all had those collaborations where they go less than great, you know? And so I, I think that's one of the, the most valuable lessons you can learn when you have to work in teams, make stuff, work with industry, you're trying to design stuff, you have to negotiate things back and forth, right? You have to better understand things, right? It's not necessarily that's like, can we just do this? Um, but it's like, this is my, this is the, the, the intent. Am I on the right track? You know what I mean? It, it's sort of how you begin to frame the conversation. You frame things differently um, when you're when you're talking to somebody they have respect for and they become an interlocutor, a collaborator, not just somebody you're trying to to dictate something to, right? So, you know, to me, I think that's that's really really important. I, I think. You know, I'm always sort of of the the mindset you 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 capture more flies with honey than a fly swatter, right? So, you know, to me, it's it's that, right? You know, how do you work with people rather than working against them? I mean, you know, yeah, it's it's definitely, and especially when we're building big structures or great projects, right? It's got it, you know, and they're complicated. I mean, buildings just buildings are getting more and more complicated. Absolutely. They're not they're not getting less complicated. They're just That's getting right. more and more complicated. I mean, we're bringing like. We've been talking, bringing technology. The, into the expectations it. get higher and higher. Too, higher right? and higher and yeah. higher. Yes, exactly. And they should because we can do it, right? So, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the expectations, but definitely more collaboration, a, lo- a, a, a lot more collaboration would go uh, a lot longer in the industry. One other thing I'll just add um, to that is, you know, the other thing is is thinking about service and giving back. Um, you know, actually, I, my, my studio starts in about 15 minutes. And I'm going to meet my my studio at a... Today, this, at a nonprofit, we're going to be doing service work the afternoon for the nonprofit. Um, yeah. And so, you know, just trying to, to get a better sense of, you know, how we can begin to make a difference out there. Uh, it continues that bottom-up theme as well, right? I mean, you know, yep. you, don't have, you don't have to come up with the killer idea that's going to change everything. Those never work, right? <laughs> um, you know, change happens one small step at a time. Yeah, right? for sure. Um, so for someone listening and they would like to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Well, you know, uh, my email's out there and my social media accounts are out there. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Um, uh, I have a, a profile on the UNLV website. If you Google me, Joshua Vermillion, I, it's one of the, you know, all these things pop up in the first five, 10, 10 uh, uh, results. Um, I'm always available via email. I, I try to be really responsive and uh, you know, I'm always happy to, to, uh, um, respond to feedback or, or try to answer questions or um, I'm always interested in interesting ideas. Um, if anybody has any or, or has any um, uh, anything they want to say to me, I'm, I'm always happy to, to listen. Um, yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Joshua, for uh, participating on the um, podcast. I, it was a great conversation. I'm, I'm so excited that there's people like you out there thinking big about what the built environment's going to look like. Um, you know, just how we use spaces, how we can change change cities throughout a day. I mean, that, those are just mind blowing concepts. I mean, it's just we and and then how do we use the digital technologies that are out there to actually, you know, like you 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 had a saying that said smart people solving complex problems or I, yeah. I, serious people doing trying to trying to fix serious things here right you know? exactly i love that right it's serious not people, just pretty pictures yeah serious people try to do serious things and i think that's great right i mean I, and that's what technology is there for so I, I really appreciate you participating on this i want to thank the listeners for uh sitting around listening to the podcast i hope you guys all got something out of it um, remember to look at the the website um, to see future episodes and our blog posts and all the other DMA stuff out there so you can see Joshua's stuff and um, all the other stuff that's being put out there. And, and I encourage you to look at Joshua's Instagram to see what he's producing with the, uh, with the bot. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.